And here we go. So again, my name is Mike. I'm with Clear Admit. Uh, I'm actually a uh, director of partnerships and sales and um, work with a bunch of different areas on the team. Enough about me, enough about Clear Admit. We will be sending you more information about what it is that we can do to help you with your MBA application prep later after this session. We want to make sure we give plenty of time to our schools. We have five awesome schools that you should apply to, all five actually, um, as we get through the session here today. So we'll start off with our introductions with Tony Gomez, Senior Associate Director of Master's Admissions at Carnegie Mellon Tepper. Tony, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, as Mike mentioned, my name is Tony Gomez. I am a Senior Associate Director of Master's Admissions at Tepper. Um, primarily, I'm responsible for developing our recruitment strategy and engaging external partners, and I'm uh, excited to meet you all today. Awesome. We're excited to have you and meet you as well. Uh, next, we have Amy Mitson, Director of Admissions, Recruitment, and Marketing at the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth College. Hi, Amy. Thank, hi, hi, Mike. Thanks. Uh, great to be here with everybody from all around the world. Um, broadcasting here from New Hampshire. Uh, again, Amy Mitson. I've uh, been at Tuck for, for many, many years in a combination of student services and now admissions. So really excited to think about the next season of applications with everybody here. Awesome. Yes, we are uh, excited as well for those early birds getting started. So uh, thank you for joining us. Next, we have Nathan Eisenberg, Senior Associate Director of Admissions at Michigan Ross. Hi, Nathan. Hey, thanks, Mike. Welcome, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Thanks so much for taking time out of your busy day to learn more about these MBA programs. Again, my name is Nathan. I'm the Senior Associate Director of Admissions for the Ross Full-Time MBA and Global MBA program. So excited to share a little bit more about what makes Ann Arbor unique. Awesome. Yes, I mean, it is. Uh, like, I like the kind of got the Midwestern vibe, but talk has that same kind of thing, the outdoorsy space, you know, and now I'm going to switch it right over to totally different atmosphere over with Lauren Calio, Senior Director, MBA Admissions at NYU Stern. Lauren, how are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Mike. It's great to be here. And thank you all for joining us today. I am Lauren Calio, a Senior Director of MBA Admissions at Stern. I have been at Stern just about six years, just a little over six years. And during that time, have worked on marketing and enrollment for our two-year full-time MBA program, as well as our one-year MBA programs in technology and fashion and luxury. So thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you for being here. And last but definitely not least, we have Bruce Delmonico, Assistant Dean for Admissions at Yale School of Management, Yale SOM for short. Bruce, thanks for being here. Mike, thanks so much. It's great to be here. Great to join these wonderful colleagues and, and sharing our insights into the uh, the application and, and give some, hopefully, some useful tips to everyone. I want to thank everyone as well for joining from, from near and far. Uh, it's great to connect with uh, prospective MBA applicants and uh, look forward to today's session. Awesome. Yes. Thank you for being here as well. And thank all five of you for being here to uh, put together this awesome panel. So the first thing we want to do to start this off is kind of start at the very beginning, right? So we're going to talk more about what the application is to MBA programs, what you're looking for, what people actually have to submit, kind of those hard items, right? But what are the soft items? What are the, what are the core values of your program? And are there things about those core values that kind of influence your team when you're evaluating applicants and those admissions materials? So um, we'll go back to the beginning with Tony. Uh, we're going to try to stick to alpha order, so we're not favoring any schools. Sorry, Bruce. Uh, I know you know it's not your fault that you work at Yale. I know it just you know we should work on that name change. I think we need to do that to make these sessions better. Well, you, we're used to. We assume we should be the AAA Yale School of Management. <laughs> I like it. All right. So um, so Tony, we'll start with you. You know, what are the core values over at Tepper, and how do those values inform the way that your team approaches the process? Yeah, so in our MBA and in the, the school in general, we really have six core values that we operate from. So we operate from a place of integrity, inclusivity, um, entrepreneurial spirit, collaboration, rigor, and agility. Um, we really try to, to exemplify these in our approach to the admissions process by operating in an ethical and honest manner with all of our candidates, really trying to make the process as transparent as possible, trying to develop and create this heterogeneous class that enriches the academic experience for, for everyone. Um, as far as the entrepreneurial spirit, you know, my team is very willing to, to take risks uh, when it comes to recruiting our class and, and just uh, innovating in the way that we work there. We work in a collaborative way 
in reviewing everybody's application. Um, so that way there are multiple eyes on multiple candidates at a time. And uh, we try to make the best uh, data informed and human driven approach that we can into the decision making process. Sounds good to me. And it sounds like you know, what you would expect from Tepper with a very data heavy. I see the intelligent future behind you. So it definitely makes sense there. Um, okay, so now we'll switch over to Amy. Same questions. What are the core values over Dartmouth Tuck and how do those values inform the way you evaluate the missions? Yeah, thank you. Well, um, starting um, with our, our mission at Tuck is to educate wise, decisive leaders who better the world through business. And that is lived out through our core values of personal, connected, transformative. So the personal piece refers to the way students get to know one another in a small community with a class size of about 285 students. You get to know every single member of the class before you, behind you, um, and that, that's the personal piece. Um, the connected um, refers to just how you're connecting with one another when you're on campus in Hanover and then connecting to the outside world, whether that is alumni and recruiters and CEOs coming to campus or students headed out to global travel and MBAs. Uh, so everybody out there, in addition to getting your applications ready, get your passports ready because people in MBA programs, these students travel quite a bit. Um, so for education, um, for fun um, and, and to be together. And so the connected piece is really, you're in Hanover, but the numerous ways that you're connecting to the broader uh, alumni and Tuck community, um, as well as Dartmouth and the outside world with some of the global opportunities that you have at Tuck. And transformative, that third core value refers to the transformation that you hope to have. Um, in particular, students would put number one on that list is the transformation they hope to have with their career. But it's thinking about your your you know most um, sincere personal and professional aspirations, what you hope to achieve in the MBA, and that transformation does happen at Tuck and through through those core values that are lived out in every single way. Um, you have the that opportunity and the personal connected transformative piece. You'll feel that in the application process. So it's not just the facts of answering questions, but it's also the feeling of you know who you are and why you want to take this next step and where you want to be. So that personal piece, um, you won't be anonymous in the admissions process. You won't be anonymous as a student. The connections that you make with me and other members of the admissions committee, as well as our students and alumni, when you are getting to know Tuck and understanding the application process, that connection is, is very much there as well. So um, the core values are within everything that we do, but personal, connected, transformative, um, just having the opportunity to get to know yourself a little bit better as you get to know us when you're applying. Makes sense. And I think that is something as we'll discuss more of uh, what you are looking for, opening up yourself as an open book during the application process. Uh, it's uncomfortable at times, but it's needed and it will definitely help you uh, get to that next level. It sounds like you'll be welcomed, uh, your personality when you arrive at Tuck. So thank you for all of that. Uh, Nathan, we'll switch over to you with Michigan Ross. What are the core values? How does it influence or does it influence your decision making? Yeah, great question. So we've got about five core values here at Michigan Ross, and they really hinge around connecting, collaborate, learn and grow, do great things, be an owner, and be inclusive. And when we look at those five values, they really play out throughout your personal and professional experiences and help our team really inform how to make sure that we're making the best fit in both ways. So for an MBA program, you've got to make sure that you're not only shaking the trees and understanding the institutions that you're applying for, not only understanding how are you going to make an impact in those organizations, but are those organizations going to be able to make an impact on you, your professional and your personal goals? So when our team evaluates applications, connecting and collaborating, we want to know how are you going to show up? Because in this ever-changing business world, we know that you need to learn how to work with one another, learn with partners, and learn with people that you don't necessarily get along with. And those are going to be important salient points of learning and growth throughout the application process as well as in the MBA itself. Learn and grow, obviously, if you're thinking about coming to an MBA program, you are looking to continue your education. You're looking to push yourself out of 
of those boxes. So how do you continue that process through the application? How are you looking to continue and learn and grow in the work that you do right now, professionally or personally outside of the classroom? Do great things. So we're looking for you not only to have years of work experience, but the impact. What kind of impact are you having in your organization, in your personal networks, in your community, both locally and nationally? And be an owner, you know, whether or not things go well, you know, in the application process, you may have one of your essay examples be about uh, a situation where you tried something and failed. And that is not a vulnerability. That is taking ownership of executable opportunities and the results there and be inclusive. Obviously, in this ever-changing world, in globalization, we are going to have so many different people with so many different backgrounds, with so many different personalities. It is incredibly important for us to create an atmosphere inclusive of inclusivity, not only in the classroom, but outside of the classroom when we send our students all over the world for our MAP project, our multidisciplinary action projects where students are doing seven a week in project learning experiences across the world to short-term, long-term international exposures to the classes and the students and the peers that are going to be traveling from all around the world like they are here tonight on this call or today on this call. So it is important to learn about those values and understand, are those the values that are going to be salient for you? Because at the end of the road, each school you're hearing from today and moving forward, it is a lifetime relationship. It's not a two-year transactional program, and it's important for you to understand not only the values of the institution, but your own values as well. That's great. Yeah, it definitely is, right? You'd be a part of that alumni network forever, um, which is which is a great way. Thanks for taking ownership of that question and providing a great response. So I will move on to Lauren at uh, NYU Stern. Same thing, core values, and does it and how does it inform your missions process? Sure, absolutely. So our core values at Stern really revolve around being a school that is at the forefront of innovation and change and not being afraid to push that forward and to really make an impact both at the school and on the greater society. Um, I think that's really a goal that we have for our students coming, you know, during their time in the MBA program and then once they graduate. One of the core values, though, that I really want to highlight is around IQ plus EQ. So for us, this is really important. We know that students that are ultimately applying and enrolling at Stern are going to be strong academically, professionally. They're going to be successful in a number of different ways. And we're also looking for them to be um, to have strong emotional intelligence and strong emotional quotient. And so when people say to me, what does that mean? To me, that really means someone who is self-aware, someone who is really able to embrace diversity to work through conflict and to work through that change. So someone that you really want to be working with or working for, someone that you want to have lunch with, someone that you want on your team. It's important to us in the admissions process so that we assess for that in a few different ways through some of the questions that we ask on the application. I think we'll have a chance to get into that a little bit more later, but it's also important to us because it's something that recruiters are asking for and are looking for as well. So we often hear from recruiters that this is really a value that stands out from Stern students. So we do assess for that in the application process because those folks ultimately become our students, they ultimately become alums, and that becomes the broader Stern network. Yeah, it makes sense to uh, kind of look at that end of the journey and kind of work backwards a bit. So a uh, great way to do that there. And Bruce, we've been waiting for you. I know I apologize for, again, AAA, Yale, some. Um, I'll be ready for that at the next session. Core values over at Yale, and how do they inform your process? Yeah, no, thanks, Mike. And in, in the meantime, I'm happy to go last as someone has to. Uh, and I appreciate it. Give me a chance to listen to all the great answers the other schools gave, and and um, uh, and and kind of like hear more about about their 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 values and and how how they operate, uh, which is always really interesting to me. You know, at Yale. Um, we we really are, I think, are guided by our founding mission to ed educate leaders for business and society. That's been the mission of the school um, for the for for decades since it since its its found, founding in the you know back in the, the 1970s. And so um, that really animates uh, how we do things here at Yale, and it, it informs uh, how we approach not just admissions, but you know the, the you know things happening at the school more generally. Um, it means lots of different things, but I think at court means we have really aspire for our, our graduates to think broadly about about the kind of impact they can have. Um, we have graduates going into, I think some people, you know, translate it very narrowly into, you know, we have about into sort of nonprofit or, 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 public, or, or uh, the social sector. We have lots of graduates going into not just the private sector, but the nonprofit and public sectors, but really 
at core, it means that we want you to, whatever you do, and, and we have lots of graduates who actually have careers that span the sectors, is really think about, again, the impact in, in a broad sense. And, and what that means, you know, one of the ways in which that mission animates what we do at the school is that we have a, a very distinctive integrated curriculum um, that requires you as a student to, to think across disciplines, across uh, across uh, sectors, across industries, and, and really see the big picture and think holistically. Um, and so from an admissions perspective, um, one of the things we uh, look for are, are students who really do have a broad mindedness and intellectual curiosity that will help, you know, we really, really align with uh, not just the mission, but but the curriculum and really the way we, we see um, sort of leaders um, engaging uh, with their with their organizations, with their communities, with the world, um, in, in in being successful in the 21st century. So that's been a lot of of what informs um, how we do things. And I think, you know, I could give a, a few more, uh, maybe adjectives or a few more ways to describe sort of the mission and the values. The, the one thing that I always come back to, though, is I think you know our core, our our, our students in the school uh, are are you know the, the word that comes back to me is, is optimism. I think we. We really, and not just the sense that we're kind of students at Yale so are, are happy, although I think they are, which is a good thing, uh, but really that they feel that um, they can make a difference in the world and that's a worthwhile thing to do and that kind of optimism. I think that's at core what we're, we're looking for. And I think one of the things that is, um, I'm not gonna say distinctive of, of MBA programs, but kind of but but kind of central to, to what we do here at Yale. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to all five of you for lots of really great answers. Um, let us know in the chat, for those of you joining us today, do any of those core values resonate with you? Do, do they strike a chord? Do they make a school sound more interesting to you? Um, just let us know, because it's interesting to see how kind of these core values may influence, uh, you know, which schools you may consider applying to. So uh, definitely let us know. For this next part, we're going to get into each of our five schools talking about their MBA application. First, we want to just kind of show you a quick list. This is generally what these schools are going to be asking for with slight variations. And why we're gonna go through each school is to kind of talk about those variations and um, you know, what makes their process a little bit unique. But you can see this list, you can watch the video later to kind of look through it again. So just wanna kind of show that quickly as we move in. Um, again, what we're gonna ask each school to do is kind of look at their requirements and let us know what's kind of different or is there any kind of moments within the application that folks should be a little more aware of, right? Spend a little more time with or just be a little more careful with when they're applying to your particular program. Maybe it has to do with your process or you know, the fact that your application might be a little different. Um, what I will preface in this section is we're going off of the application requirements for the fall 23 entry term, which for many schools, that's kind of coming to an end right now. So if you're applying for fall 24 or beyond fall 23, we'll say at least, right? These requirements may change. So just keep that in mind. We're gonna discuss what these schools have available now. If there are any changes that are known, maybe we'll talk about those, um, but just look at their websites when you go to apply. If it's a little different from this session, it's because we're going off of last year's information. So we'll go back to Tony to get started here. This is the list that we have for Carnegie Mellon Pepper. What do you see here? What do you want people to be aware of? Um, take it from there. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thanks, Mike. So as Mike said, these are our requirements. Um, right now, the only possible change that I can uh, telegraph right now is the application fee. We're looking at possibly restructuring that or um, you know, expanding maybe even a waiver process. Uh, so that way it's not as much of a barrier to, to a lot of students that it typically has been. Um, but no, everything else is pretty standard. We do require one essay. Our essay centers around the theme of uh, creating an inclusive environment. So little insider tip, the more um, active you have been in that process, the more that will resonate and, uh, and compel us uh, in that way. So make sure it's, it's compelling and that you're an active participant in creating uh, inclusive environments. But uh, no, we, we are a pretty transparent uh, application and essentially it's, it's the old WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. Awesome. Thank you for that. And we wrote down, we'll do this for anybody who has kind of new information. If there's changes, right, it'll be in the video at least. So, uh, so there you go. So thank you for that. Um, awesome stuff. So we'll move on now to Amy and I will make sure we clear out uh, the annotation there. But, um, you know, here's your requirements. Let us know what people need to look out for, what you're expecting, all that fun stuff. 
Great. Um, so uh, we are in the update season now, so there may be slight changes, but broadly, um, you know, the application, um, there is an application fee, um, but anyone can apply for an application fee waiver. So as soon as you open an application, you have the opportunity to do that. Um, the requirements that you see here, I'll call them um, very standard, um, but obviously the application is online, transcripts um, are required, resume, um, you see the big picture items here. We will still likely be at three essays. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about those in a second. Definitely two recommendations and the requirement for um, a, a language test if English is, is not your native language. Um, so thinking about the application, I just think planning out your time is um, is a not a secret to success, but I think that will help you be successful there. You know, Yes, three essays are required, but as you go through, um, definitely taking the time that you need to get your resume together. Um, we offer a guide to resumes through our Tuck360 blog. So you wanna make sure that resume represents you. It's a resume that the application readers will see. Um, the resume is a nice um, landing spot often when I am reading an application um, to say, okay, let me get the big picture of who this person is. So I love to see that the dates in the resume also match the dates when you go through and complete the biographical information in the application. So in addition to like the kind of the, the big the big ticket items of those essays, you have space in the application where we're going to ask for some short answer detail on, you know, where have you been working? What was the nature of your work? So it gives you a chance to be a little bit more descriptive and that to do that thoughtfully can take a little bit of time. So you wanna make sure you have time for the actual application piece. Think about that as like two big pieces there, the application, there's essays and recommendations within that application, but in the application we ask for, you know, the biographical information, um, your work history, and uh, tell us a little bit about what you've done, um, and you can describe your employer. So that helps people kind of shed some light sometimes when they feel like they need to and want to explain where they've been working. The other thing to note is we ask two very short answer questions that ask you to um, describe your short-term and long-term goals. So that is in a short answer format. I think it's 75 words or something like that. So very, very succinctly short and long-term goals. It gives you an opportunity to put those goals there. And then when you go into your essays, you don't have to feel any pressure to incorporate your specific goals into the essays. So briefly, the first essay, very straightforward. I love reading this question. Candidates love to answer it usually because it is straightforward. Why MBA and why Tuck? Right? So a little bit about like, why are you at this point? Why is now the right time for the MBA? Why would Tuck be the place where you want to be? Um, so very straightforward. Um, and, and again, that's the start of the personal story that's going to begin to tell the admissions committee, why are you doing what you're about to do, right? In the resume, I can see what, but in the essays, I get to see a little bit more of the why. So you have that, um, you know, why MBA, why Tuck? Then the second essay question will ask you something about, um, you know, tell us a little bit who, about who you are and your contribution in this personal and connected community. So it's very much um, just a, you know, something about you personally and who you are in the community. And again, it gives you a chance to connect with Tuck in that essay and share a little bit about yourself. Um, and then the third essay uh, maps to our uh, one of our admissions criteria, which is encouraging. So we'll ask you to tell us about a time. Tell us about a time you had the opportunity to work with and support others, um, whether that's in a professional setting or outside work or with life and family. So um, so those are those are the essay questions in general. Um, the essay, the specific essay questions will be launched to the Tuck360 blog. Usually we're able to do that by June 1st, maybe before the end of May, as we get really organized to launch the new application. But all of the aspects of the application from the resume to the essays, to the recommendations, to the interview, all of the components of the application map to our admissions criteria 
So all applicants are evaluated around the criteria of smart, accomplished, aware, and encouraging. We share very specific blog posts about how we look at the criteria, how and where, um, how we define the criteria and where we look for it in the application. So thinking about the SMART criteria. So that will be reflected in um, transcripts and in test scores and um, in your letters of recommendation and in how you present yourself in an interview. Accomplished, we see that in the resume and from letters of recommendation and you talking a little bit about your personal and professional pursuits and where you've been able to demonstrate impact. Um, aware is a tell us a little bit about who you are. Um, who are you and how did you get here today? You know, so telling, sharing a little bit of the understanding of yourself and your story up until this point and that encouraging criteria, that, that speaks to the heart of working in a small community. Do you have the ability to work with and support others even when um, it maybe doesn't directly benefit you? And so quick overview of the criteria there and I should probably uh, curtail my comments and we can move on to the next panelist, but the criteria map specifically to the aspects of the application, and we detail that for you on the Tuck360 blog. And one last comment about our interview process. Um, so everyone who applies to Tuck, um, you can either guarantee yourself an interview or wait to be invited. And so to guarantee yourself an interview, you would submit your application um, on an accelerated timeline. And so we will have three application rounds one specific dates aren't released yet, but usually end of September, beginning of January, and the end of March. And with all of those, um, you know, you would submit the application a month early, and that would give you um, that would guarantee you an interview. Otherwise, you would be invited to interview, um, and then our second year students conduct interviews. And the majority of interviews will be done virtually, but we are going to open up some opportunities to do in-person interviews. So as the applicant, you will have the choice, um, whether virtual or in-person. So um, yeah, so I think that gets us off to a good start with some of the beginning requirements. And um, yeah, and thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. And um, I will go back to one of the things you mentioned about the online application itself, right? Like here, it looks like just a simple little bullet point, but some of these online applications are pretty in-depth. So uh, don't do everything else and leave that application for the last minute and think I can finish this in an hour. Um, sometimes like that could be a lot of time to fill that stuff out. So, so start everything early, sign up for those accounts on all these schools' websites early so you can see what these things look like and then properly schedule out your time. So it's so a great point there. Uh, yeah, it's definitely not the, uh, I and mean, it could be the shortest, but it's, it's not as short as you may think it is to fill out the application at many of these schools. So thanks, Amy, for all of that. Uh, we'll shift over to Nathan over at Michigan Ross. Uh, take us through your application. Anything we need to be aware of or anything that makes it a little bit different or special? <laughs> Yeah, thanks for, for setting that preference too. And when it comes to the online application, I can say one thing that tells us something is when you don't tell us something. So a blank spot in the application tells us a spot that you decided to either withhold or not complete the application. So make sure to dedicate time to filling out the entire online application for every school that you're applying to. Um, from the application process, it's pretty similar to many of the other schools. We only require one letter of recommendation. We ask it come from a um, professional recommendation. So whether that is a current or a former supervisor, um, from the short answers and the essays, we've actually taken a different approach. So whereas Tuck, they ask you what, why, and now. Um, for us, we don't ask why Ross, we don't ask why an MBA, we will ask you those questions in an interview. So that is a guarantee if you are invited to interview, we will ask you those questions. But in our application, we have short essay questions um, in two different groups. So in one group, we're asking you questions like what I want people to know that I or I made a difference when I or I was aware that I was different when. And then the second group of questions is I was out of my comfort zone when I was humbled when. I was challenged when. So again, thinking back about the values that I shared in the in the first section, this is where we're really honing in in that 100 words. So it's very 
very tight real estate there, but we want you to get to the heart of it. What is important to you? How are you going to show up at Michigan Ross? What values are you going to bring? What kind of skills and abilities are you bringing to the table that you're going to not only continue to grow and develop, throughout an MBA, but share with your peers in the program. So thinking about how are you going to be able to contribute in a really short answer um, and very concise, because again, we're preparing you for business. So we're preparing you for that job out of school. We're preparing you to really be succinct with your storytelling, with your elevator pitch. And so we want you to get those chops ready in the application process itself. So we do, again, require the resume. It is our jumping off point. So make sure that you're adding any kind of work that you've done, any kind of volunteer experiences, things that you're interested in, because we like to get to know you in that next level. So if you're adding that bullet point at the end that says you like to hike, take it a little step further. Do you like to hike the Appalachian Trail? Have you hiked peaks over in Indian China? You know, tell us a little bit more about who you are and what you're passionate about there. Uh, for the standardized test, we do require either a standardized test or what we call a statement of academic readiness. So instead of the test waiver process where you submit a test waiver, we evaluate it, and then we tell you whether or not you're approved. We've gone away with the back and forth. Now, at the time that you submit your application, you are either going to be submitting one of the test scores listed here, or you're going to be submitting that essay that would have been the test waiver application telling us about everything that you've been doing that really makes sure and covers your quantitative and academic skills and abilities outside of an academic test itself. Um, from the language exam, uh, similar to other schools, if you completed a bachelor's degree in an institution that was taught primarily in English, you are not required to submit that and the standardized application fee. And we do invite interviews, um, again, by invitation only, and we have three rounds of applications. So similar to what Amy just shared, our rounds are gonna be around the similar time frame, September, January, and then probably in like April or May. So that's kind of the, the highlight of our application process. Awesome, thanks for walking us through that uh, and the addition of that other option for the test as well. Always good to know. Um, Thank you. All right. So now, uh, and again, give me a chance to erase that from your section here, Lauren, because well, you have it also, um, but take us through the uh, NYU Stern application. Uh, you know, what makes it unique? What are things to look out for? All of the above. Absolutely. So I know I mentioned earlier, I talked a little bit about IQ plus EQ, and that is something that we look for in the application process. So you can see here the different, the different things that we do require as part of the application. What I do want to highlight in terms of us looking for EQ throughout the application is a few things. So one, you see our letters of recommendation here. We actually call them EQ endorsements. And the reason that we do that is we do ask some of the standard questions that you would typically see asked of a recommender. But the difference here is that we're also asking them to give us an example or talk about a time when you demonstrated EQ. So that's going to give us an opportunity for your professional recommender to tell us about that. Um, the other way that we're looking for EQ is through our pick six. So that is one of our essays that you see here. Our pick six will ask you to share six pictures, images, photos um, with us and as sort of an introduction. So we say this is the way that you would introduce, introduce yourself to your future classmates and provide six images and a short caption for each of those. So what we're looking to do here is really get to learn more about you beyond what we're finding on your resume or in your career essay. So we really want to know what gets you out of bed in the morning, what or who motivates you, what are some experiences that you've had in life that you might want to share. So this is a really good way to take a step back and say, okay, what, am, what else can I tell Stern about myself? And the pick six is a really great way to do that. The other thing that I'd like to highlight is our interview process. So in our, our interviews are also by invitation only, and all of our interviews are hosted by members of the admissions committee. And the other piece of this is that member of the admissions committee will have had the chance to review your entire application prior to that interview. So that means that during the interview, we're really able to, again, have a conversation beyond the things that you presented in your application. And sure, there might be things within the application that we'd like to talk about or that we might have questions on, but it's just a good chance to get to know you even better beyond that. And it's also a good chance for you to ask us questions about the school as well. 
So just touching on some of the things here, I'm seeing some questions in the chat around the tests, um, the English proficiency tests. So same at Stern, if you completed an undergrad or graduate program that was taught primarily, primarily in English, you do not have to provide one of those tests. We also have an application fee, but you can go onto our website and request an application fee waiver. And then you'll also hear, see about our standardized test options. We do not have a preference amongst these tests. So I saw someone asking about GMAT versus GRE. We do not have a preference in terms of the test that you are submitting. We also have an application, excuse me, a standardized test waiver request that you can fill out on our website as well. So those are just, are just a few of the things that I'd like to highlight and just sort of keeping in mind as you're going through your application that you're really telling us about who you are um, and taking the chance to say, okay, how am I really demonstrating my EQ through the application process? It is something that we're looking for. Tell you what, it makes that first question we asked, uh, I mean, it's perfect. Like if the core value is drawn throughout the process. It's even one of the names, you changed the name of my bullet point here. This is perfect. Um, so that's awesome. Thank you for walking us through that. Um, yeah, I think we're good here. I think the one thing you said as well, it's interesting is that for many of these schools, yes, if you have that English uh, educational background, the test will be waived. So uh, for those who didn't mention earlier, it's, that's likely the case at many of the schools that you'll be applying to. Um, so thank you for mentioning that, and I'll just kind of like underline that for the rest of the schools who, who may not have said that earlier. Uh, okay, great. So we'll move up again, Bruce, hanging out here. Thanks for hanging out and uh, getting us through to your application. Take a look at the list here. We have a couple of different things on your checklist that are a little different from the other schools, so that may be kind of, we're giving you a little bit of a, a, a head start here and what you may want to discuss, but, uh, you know, take it, take it in any direction you want. <laughs> Sure, happy to do that, and uh, thanks so much. And I will, um, you know, in terms of the Yale application, I'll, I will a, lot, a number of the elements, the online application itself, sort of transcript, resume, um, those are similar to what you would, a recommendation similar to what, uh, uh, you know, other schools have already spoken about. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that are maybe a little bit more unique to the Yale process. Um, uh, and, and I would start by uh, saying, first of all, the sort of the essay, one, one required essay, We've had it for seven years. Describe your biggest commitment. Uh, uh, there's there's a good chance that that will uh, change this year. I don't know if we'll either replace it or we might supplement it. Uh, but there might be some tweaking to the essay this upcoming year. So I would wait, hold off. We'll announce as I know there have been some comments in the in the chat that you know I'm a, I'm an active emailer. So you will hear from us about our, our essay topic when that happened, when it's when it's updated. Um, you know whether it's the the to describe your biggest commitment or whether it's something new or uh, some some combination. So uh, I would I would hold off on the essay for the moment until we do announce it, um, which is maybe a change from the past when we've, when we've been very confident we're keeping the essay. Um, the other thing we were been talking a good bit about English language uh, uh, requirement, English language test. We don't have one. Uh, we actually um, one of the other elements, the you know two bullets down from the the no language exam requirement required is video questions. So probably about a dozen or so years ago, uh, we um, we uh, incorporated video questions into our our application. These are short. Um, so, uh, you know, in the moment responses uh, that you give to so, uh, uh, three different prompts that we provide. Um, we'll, we talk more about the process itself elsewhere, and we're happy, I'm happy to share more about that. But the idea is things like the TOEFL and the IELTS um, were, you know, were in the Pearson test, of English, Pearson test of English were okay at, at measuring language skills, but they were they were not perfect. They were, sometimes there'd be a, someone would do well, but their English wasn't great. Sometimes they do less well and they actually have fine English. So they were both under, over and under inclusive. And also they were expensive and time consuming. Uh, and so we figured, you know, let's let's dispense with that. Let's save you all sort of the time and expense of having to go do the TOEFL, do the IELTS. Uh, we have this, what takes maybe, you know, five to seven minutes, this, this quick uh, assessment that we have um, we, this is happens after you submit your initial application. We will provide you a, a, a link to the our, our platform, Kiratel. We used a previous, a different years ago. We used a different vendor. We use Kiratel, which a few other schools use, um, to measure your English language ability. Uh, and and that's it's quick and easy. And we feel like that's a, a, a you know a, a, a more efficient approach for you um, uh, as an applicant. I think better for us actually as a, an admissions office as well. Uh, similarly, we talked about the application fee that's been, been mentioned a, a few times. We actually have a sliding scale application fee. So it's 250 for, uh, for um, that's a standard amount, but uh, it's based on your annual total compensation. 
um, and it can be stepped down to 175 or 125, so up to a 50% discount on your application fee based on how much you're earning. And the idea is that just, again, to recognize that this is an expensive process uh, that, and that there, there's different industries, different geographies that compensate differently. And so we wanna be sensitive to that uh, and, and kind of adjust our fee accordingly, depending on your, your annual compensation. So that's another, another piece of it. Um, I will say in terms of, um, and, then, and then maybe some of the bigger, one, one big piece that's, that's maybe more unique is the behavioral assessment. Um, so we, we do require the standardized test, the GMAT or the GRE. We find that those, those are validated to performance in the program and they're an important components. So we don't wanna, you know, we, look, we, we work every year, we work with um, internally uh, and externally with psychometricians to, to evaluate how predictive those, those tests are and, and what other things we can look at to help get a better sense for uh, 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 your your performance in, in the program, as as which is what they measure, um, and actually we we're, instead of eliminating those tests, what we're doing is supplementing and providing new data because we don't we know that that's um, you know those, it's not a one size fits all. Uh, you know, a, 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 a single score doesn't mean the same thing for every applicant. Uh, there's a lot of context that that we need to uh, apply and a lot of um, you know a lot of additional information that that can help inform. Well, what what that information means, what those test test scores mean. Same with academics. Same with the, the other parts of your application. We've actually spent the last few years building out those context questions, and we've actually actually worked with vendors to to um, provide frameworks that are structured and consistent to to do so. And the behavioral assessment is actually an important one. We actually this is something again like the video questions. It's it's a post submission element to the application. Um, and the idea is it's it's meant to be a non-cognitive assessment. So the you know the GMAT and the GRE are cognitive assessments. Uh, GPA kind of it, it, it gets at those cognitive skills as well. But there's much more to Lauren's uh, you know comments about EQ and IQ. There's much more that that goes into your your candidacy, your potential, your performance than just the sort of the cognitive piece. So this behavioral assessment actually me measures your non-cognitive skills. It measures a series of interpersonal and interpersonal skills that will help us understand how well you'll perform in the classroom and, and then beyond. And what it does is actually allows us to be more expansive. We can look beyond standardized tests. We can look beyond GPA, be more expansive in how we're, we're uh, uh, looking at your candidacy um, and really um, and be very, very um, I think much more, much more holistic in our view, uh, in, in our approach. Obviously holistic admissions is what we're all about. And this actually allows us to be even more so. Behavioral assessment is a really interesting tool. It was originally developed by West Point um, here in the U.S. Uh, to to uh, for officer development, uh, and it was actually purchased by ETS. They they run the GRE um, a, a number of years ago. We've been working with with them for the better part of a decade to adapt this for our context for for the high stakes admissions context. Um, and uh, as I said, it measures a series of, it takes about 20, 25 minutes to, to, to take, it measures a series of in, interpersonal and interpersonal skills that again, gives us better context into your candidacy. The reason we do this, we, we've gravitated towards behavioral assessment is we care very much about reducing and, and as much as possible, eliminating bias and subjectivity in the process. So and rather than us looking for signs of your, of, of your um, sort of non-cognitive traits, your interpersonal, interpersonal skills, um, through various elements of the application, we have this behavioral assessment that's more consistent. Um, it, it's 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 predictive, predictive. It's validated, but it's also very consistent across candidates because we do care about that. We try to eliminate and reduce bias in the process more generally. So that's um, that's a little bit about that, which I think is a more unique element of the application. Um, other other elements I think are, are are similar. I would one other thing I would also say we obviously have our direct to Yale application. We also um, have, have partnered with QuestBridge for for any for any candidates who are uh, you know on this on this session. Uh, when we're QuestBridge uh, uh, students in college uh, use the QuestBridge scholarship for college, we actually have partnered with QuestBridge um, to extend that to graduate school to the MBA. Um, two years ago, we start we we partnered with Stanford and Chicago Booth. We were the three of us um, rolled out this QuestBridge uh, uh, graduate school match. Um, and, and now that we're going to our third year with that, and we've added Wharton to that. So it's uh, Stanford, Chicago, Wharton, and Yale um, doing the QuestBridge mats. If any of you have uh, applied to 
uh, went went to college through Quest, the QuestBridge process. Um, and we're also members of, I think there's a number of other schools here, the Consortium for Graduate Study and Management, which is another process uh, to increase diversity and inclusion in American business. And that's something that a number of our schools are, are part of. So that's a little bit um, that's, uh, that's um, more unique, I think, about, uh, about the Yale process. I've seen some, and one last comment, I've seen some, some comments about sort of minimums or in terms of work experience or test scores. Like these, uh, I, I can't speak for other schools, but I think probably similar to other schools, we have no minimum in terms of test scores, certainly, or GPAs. We actually don't have any minimum in terms of work experience either. Most of our students have some level of work experience, but we actually have our Silver Scholars Program. That's a direct to, to, to business school program. You, you apply in your last year of undergraduate, so as a senior in college, and you can start with us immediately after graduating. So if you graduate, you know, if you graduate this May or this June, you would start with us this fall. It's a little bit different than a lot of schools who have these deferred um, admission programs where you, you apply and are admitted in your final year of undergraduate, but you, you work for two years. With us, you go straight through. So we do have some students who um, go, go to come to us without any professional experience straight from college. Um, so that's one thing to note. And then I did see some comments about, again, no minimum test score, no minimum GPA. Our test score range, actually, if you think about the GMAT or GRE, it's actually rather expansive. We, we probably will be, you know, the averages are kind of mid 600s to mid 700s in terms of uh, sort of the, the mid 80% range for the, for, the, for the GMAT. But actually we will probably admit mid 500s to, to high 700s. So it's a pretty, pretty broad range. And so I think one thing I would share with you all as you're thinking about where to apply and how to position yourself at, is, um, is, you know, don't be too off, put off by averages that we post on our websites or even ranges because those are both, the averages are both very reductive. We have people on both sides of the averages, obviously, you know, and if it's a median, obviously half of the people are on below and half are above. Um, but then in terms of even the ranges, those are the ranges of our incoming classes. But usually we will, we will have admitted a much broader range um, to get to that, that, that uh, incoming class range. So don't, don't disqualify yourself or kind of take yourself out of, the, out of consideration based on those numbers, because we, I think we all probably admit a rather broad range. And we're looking at much more than just the grades or the scores. We're looking at your whole profile and looking at all the things that go into your candidacy and that would make you terrific students and ter terrific alumni. Um, so hopefully it gives a little bit of a sense of our, our process. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and especially with that last piece of trying not to self-select out, I think that's a very common thing that folks can do. And it's that kind of, it's tough, right? Because we said this at the beginning, you're kind of opening yourself up to these schools. You're applying um, for some, you haven't applied since undergrad and a lot has changed, right? In, in those last, could be three years, could be 10 years, could be 15 years away from that. So um, you know, be confident in yourself, be confident in your schools. You're seeing a lot of different ways that um, people are evaluating you as, as a person. So there's a lot of ways you can get into these schools. It's not just a test score. It helps, but it's not just a test score that's going to get you in or get you out from a school. So um, thanks for all of you for sharing that. We have about 10 minutes left or so in the hour. So to be conscious of time, we do have a couple of pre-submitted questions that are more general topic questions. We're going to try to run through as many as we can get to, giving each school a chance to kind of lead off a question. Um, so for our panel, if we can keep each answer to like two minutes or so, so we can get through all five, that'd be great. And then we can let you all off to your breakouts. Again, for those who are still with us, our, of our attendees, um, each of our five schools will join breakouts. They'll take all of your questions or as many as they can in the time allotted. Um, so we'll make sure we get to all of these kind of specific school questions in those breakouts. So uh, we'll kick it back around over to Tony. Thanks for being patient uh, for this first question here. So again, these are all kind of aspects of the application and just some kind of like a little more in-depth um, answers potentially. So how does your team look out outside activities? Uh, do those activities, do that be volunteer oriented or could it be more of like a passion project? You know, what, what are you kind of looking for in this section? of probably that online application or maybe within the resume. Maybe that's another thing you can tell us about, like where would you find this information from a candidate? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, so a lot of students will put this information in their resume, typically, you know, after they've gone through their professional experience. Um, I personally love to see your engagement outside of your professional responsibilities, seeing how involved you are with the community or if you're following a passion project. Um, these do not necessarily have to be strictly volunteer based, but I would say that the vast majority 
or some type of service, volunteer-based project. Um, other students may be doing some uh, additional consulting work outside or working on some type of entrepreneurial uh, venture in addition to you know, their, their typical nine to five. Um, I, I think it's very valuable to see, especially if it has any connection to your, your post-MBA goals, um, but also you know, what you're bringing to the uh, tapestry of the class that, that you're hoping to come into as well. Thank you very much. Anybody have any um, any different thoughts on that? I know you know we're covering a bunch of schools today. I mean, that's pretty standard, I believe. I'm not seeing anybody nodding or changing their mind. So sounds good. Okay, I always want to make sure if there's anything very different that we uh, we cover that. So thank you, Tony. There. Um, moving on to this next question. So this one we'll kick it off with Amy. Um, so you know life happens. Sometimes it could be for good or for bad, right? Different things happen as we move through this life. Uh, so what is the constructive way for an applicant to address a past circumstance in their application? Again, it could be in multiple spots. So kind of give us the walkthrough of what you would recommend for somebody to do if they had a circumstance like this. Sure, and, and schools will welcome this information in different ways. Um, and you, you'll see that in the nuance of each uh, school where you apply, but life absolutely does happen. Um, first, start with knowing like, um, no applicant is perfect ever. I've been doing this for a long time and there, there are no, no such thing as a, as a perfect applicant. I think um, applicants can be perfect for the school they're applying to, but you don't have to be perfect to be admitted um, to, to your dream school. With life happening, that could be interruption in, um, in employment. In schooling, it could be an F or many Fs on a transcript. It could be um, taking a test, uh, you know, GMAT or G GRE test many more times than you thought. Um, it it could be, um, you know, leave of absence from work. It could be a transcript that doesn't have the perfect grades on it. That's most typically what I see when, when we think about life happening and you don't have to be um, timid to share those details. And in fact, if you think about how you wanna share them, it's best to just put it forward. Um, in, in the case of an undergrad transcript that was not your best work, for me, you'd use the optional essay to briefly explain in a, you know, a bullet point or two or a sentence or two why that, you know, those, those grades didn't go your way. So I'm going to see it on a transcript very plainly, but if you don't give me any context, then that that's a different kind of signal. You know, I'm I want to know that you are you know, aware of what you've done and, you know, understanding what you hope to do. And you can show that in the application process, but the awareness of something that feels like a life interruption, um, just be straightforward about it and make it part of your narrative. You know, that was a stumble and this is where I've gotten since then. And you can see from my other accomplishments, like it's, it is easy information to share with us. And by putting it into context, that helps the admissions committee understand, and that is our goal to understand you and your application and what you're sharing with us. So, if there is something that um, you know that that does stand out not for a positive reason, take a minute or a sentence or a bullet point to explain it, because you don't want the admissions committee jumping to a conclusion that is not correct. Oh, if you had a very short tenure um, at you know your first or second job and you also did not get a recommendation from that first or second job. You know, did you leave on bad terms? Did you leave on good terms? It was just a short stay. And so something like that, you know, uh, sometimes there is a drop down in an application for, you know, why you left a certain job, um, why you're not asking a current recommender for a recommendation if that's something that a school requires. There are places all over the application to explain and, and share details so the committee can understand. So every school will ask for it in a little bit of a different way, but if there's anything that's an outlier, you wanna share it directly so the school knows specifically from you what went on and not to make up something because I don't have enough detail. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense and, and making sure you address it. And I think, you know, touching on something Bruce said during his application process discussion with, 
you know, don't try to self-select out. Don't be thinking that you're the only one who went through something in life. I mean, from February 2020 to now, I think probably every single one of us went through probably 50 things that you would not expect to experience in a normal lifetime. So everyone probably has something on their background right now from those past two and a half years or so um, that you can probably put into your application and everybody's gonna have that same thing in there. So, um, you know, just be upfront about it, you know, just talk about it, don't try to hide it, don't try to pretend it didn't happen, you know, cause you're not the only one that went through something. So, um, so thanks for that, it's a great answer. Uh, so we'll move on now to Nathan. Uh, we're gonna look at kind of, this is like a two-parter, I guess. So you're gonna cover the, the one half of this, Lauren, you know, spoiler alert, you're going to cover the other end of this, but any advice, Nathan, for somebody who may have limited work experience, kind of like two years or less, and uh, do you look at that candidate any differently? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think this kind of relates also back to the last question. To me, it's really about controlling the narrative. You are the owner of the portfolio that you're going to be submitting to any school. So when it comes to work experience, on average, our program has about six, five to six years of work experience. However, if you are on the lower end, it really is about not necessarily the years, but the impact. How have you made a difference both in your organization and even outside your organization? So talking about those volunteer um, opportunities from the first question, what have you been able to do to make an impact in your community, either to the bottom line at work, to the people that you support, to the peers in your organization, um, to the overall recommender that's going to be submitting that information, your resume? How do you really build out and share the amount of work that you've been able to do, the amount and the, the tangible impact that you've made in those organizations. And that can come through a lot of different levers. When you think about the application process, each one of these little pieces from our application requirements section really fall into uh, maybe three or four, depending on, how, on the school, big buckets. For us at Ross, we're going to be evaluating your academic uh, ability and intellectual curiosity, your work experience and impact, and then the values within the community that I shared earlier. And so each piece of your application pours into all three of those buckets for me. And so it's about if you've only got two years of work experience, maybe that impact bucket is a little bit lower. Maybe I talk to a recommender that can share a story about a really significant work project or a tangible deliverable that I've had at work, or maybe it's uh, this outside volunteer committee that I have been work, we, working with for, let's say, five or six years, though it might be part-time, it's core to my beliefs, it's core to my value, and they can talk a little bit more about the impact I've made in that community. So again, it's about showcasing your impact. It's about showcasing your full story, thinking about those buckets of, of evaluation and which piece of the application can you use to really make the strongest profile for that particular school. Yeah, I think that's that's a great answer. And it's all about balancing those aspects of that list that's in the application. And age is just a number, right? So it might not be able to be too low, but Lauren, as we kind of previewed, could it be too high? Do you have advice for folks who are, you know, 30 plus, which I like how we, we phrased this question to say that 30 is like old. Um, I guess I'm old then, like, you know, I'm, I'm past that number. So uh, you know, for for the old heads in the room, I guess, you know, is 30 old in an MBA program? Let's let's hear that answer. Yeah, well, then I, I'm ancient, I suppose. Um, yeah, somebody had asked this earlier, and I said, you know, similarly, our average years of work experience in our program is about five years, but we have a range of zero to 14, right? And so I think some people on the higher end are looking to come back to school for different reasons. So we often see people that might be in the military that are going back into the workforce, or we see folks who are looking to make a career pivot into something different. Um, and and so and may, or some people might just be coming back to sort of build their skill set. And so I think one is really important to tell us why, right? So I might look at an application and say, oh, this person has a certain you know level or amount of experience. Why an MBA? So I think it would be important to tell us why. What are the skills that you're looking to build? If you're looking to make a pivot, what are you looking to do and how are you going to do that? So how does the experience that you have translate to the pivot that you're looking to make? Um, something that I would say to keep in mind is if you is what your ultimate goal is post MBA. Is that realistic for where you are in your career? Because we don't wanna set someone up who is looking for a more senior role that the reality is that the recruiters may not be looking for, you know, may not be recruiting at that level. So I think there does have to be sort of um, a real sort of thinking about that role that you want. And is the MBA going to be able to get you there and just talk us through that in your application? 
Yeah, I think that makes sense. And uh, I see some of these questions. The chat is 35 old. Again, I'm still I'm beyond that also. So um, again, we're picking low numbers in my mind of what's old. I think another thing to keep in mind is that many schools also have multiple MBA programs available. I know we're focusing a lot on full time today, but there are part time programs, online, executive, hybrid, flex. I mean, I can go through the list. Uh, and sometimes, you know, based on Lauren, what you were saying, you know, do your goals for your career match the program you're applying to? That's what admissions counselors can help counsel you to do is kind of, you know, maybe your focus may be better fit for a different program type. So there's always those options as well. And you're always bettering yourself with an education. So don't self-select out because of age. Like that's just a silly thing in my mind. Uh, okay, so Bruce, take us home. Uh, you know, I wrote my name wrong. I did something, I, I didn't put the right address. I bought my old address. You know, so I, I did a typo, right? Can I do something about it? What should I do? Or should I just let it go and let you figure it out? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, it, this happens not infrequently. I would say in terms of the age, by the way, we and you and, and Mike, you talked about, you know, full-time MBA versus others. We have someone in our executive MBA program who's 77. Um, so, you know, there's, there's always time to go back and had a very successful career, but wants that MBA. And so, you know, there, there, there's a big tent. There's lots of room for, for lots of people. Um, in terms of the typo, if you, oh gosh, I got my, I put this, my salary down wrong and an application, or I, I, there's a typo in my resume. Obviously, before you submit, you know, it's it's worth taking the time to, to do that, that last check and your essays, your resume. Um, one piece of advice, we, won't, we can get into the application advice more in detail later on. Um, but I think, you know, some of these things that's helpful to, one trick I, I've, I've learned is to look, to read everything backwards because it's much easier to find those typos doing it that way. Um, so to save yourself some time, I know some of the people have said that, but if you submit and you later find there's something wrong, we have a way to update. You know, we have a, a portal that allow you to update your application. You can also email us at our at our main um, sort of missions uh, email address. Um, I'm sure other schools have that too, where you can we will upload the the new uh, you know uh, a new uh, um, resume. You know, up, update your 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 essay or whatever it is that you 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 missed, um, so that you can you can have it be your application be as accurate as possible. Um, it, it can it's also frankly beyond typos um, or you know something that's uh, wrong. You know, people, you know, you might, might get a promotion, you might have a, a change, you might have a, a new score, you might have some other update. There are ways to update through our platform, update your application in other more substantive ways. So um, there is, you know, it's not, you know, after you hit submit, it's not, it's not as though everything is locked in and you can't, you know, there are no changes possible. Obviously, that's, it's much rare and you should try to avoid them in the first place. But even for things like, again, sort of new jobs or, or you know, professional, professional accomplishments or, other 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 recognitions. There are, there are ways to give us that uh, that updated information um, through through our portal, and, and you, or you could reach out to us directly. So it's all all is not lost. There you go. It's not over till it's over, as uh, we say at this time of the year, especially as folks are still waiting on some decisions. Right? It's like hang in there and and keep updating and keep making those changes and keep going for those promotions at work. Like you're still a candidate at this stage. So work on your application. Um, okay. So we're going to. Thank our panelists at this point. Thanks for hanging out for a few minutes over the hour here and uh, giving us some great answers. I know we have those kind of pre-submitted generalist questions that are really helpful for our audience to hear. So appreciate the five of you sticking around to do that. I'll release you now into your breakout spaces and then we'll send, I'll keep our attendees here for like another minute to give you a chance to you know, get a drink or I don't know what you gotta do, whatever you gotta do. Uh, go off camera for a minute, enjoy yourselves. Thank you, thanks again for all the great information and we'll see you at a future event soon. Um, and uh, for the attendees, hang with me for one minute or so. Uh, we'll let our panelists go off to their breakouts and then I will make sure we share the links with you to then be able to choose which school you want to go speak to. Thanks everyone. Thanks folks, all right. so. Uh, the next thing that I'll discuss with folks in the room still who are able to hang out, uh, you know, what can you do next? What can you do during this stage while you're waiting to apply to schools? You heard from these five programs today. And if you've been at our other events this month, you've heard that many schools are still working on their application. So it's not fully ready to go. You could definitely practice certain essays. You can download an application and, and kind of look through it and start to fill it out. But you can't submit anything yet, right? The actual application for next year is not quite ready. So what can you do? Well, on clearemit.com, we have a really great tool. You may have heard of a profile review where you can go to usually admissions consultant or some other websites where 
you know, frankly, they're, they're probably trying to sell you some, some services, right? They want you to then join them. They're going to give you some advice on which schools you can get into and which schools you can apply to. We have a tool on our website called ApplyWire. This is an area where you can go in. It is free to use. You can tell us which schools you are interested in applying to, what your background looks like, when you're going to apply, uh, and just some notes like, you know, what is the context behind your story? You heard from many schools today that there are core values. There's other things outside of the quantitative measures that they're looking for in an applicant. So you can tell us those things. And then what we actually do is we have our team go in and we will comment. And we have experts who have worked in admissions offices, been admissions directors, went to top MBA programs, work at Clear Admit, and have been around this stuff for years and years and years. So we will provide our advice and it's all free. So if you are looking for something like this for an opportunity to get some free advice, join our community, use one of our tools on ApplyWire and kind of gauge where you're at as an applicant, uh, go on to our tool. We will send you the link in the email that will go along with the link to the videos for this session and our previous sessions. Um, so you can do this on your own. And if you're lucky, if you see this last comment here on the screen, we do a podcast uh, where each week we select a few of the profiles that are submitted on our tools and we actually discuss them more in depth. So this particular candidate's profile was discussed on our wiretaps episode number 290. Uh, so you can listen to Alex and Graham, the two commenters that you see the most of here, discuss this particular profile, what they would recommend to this person, whether it is a new test score, going and you know, updating their resume one more time or going for some extra coursework with like an MBA math or an HBS course, you can see on the screen here. So um, awesome tools at ClearMit to get you started on this journey. I think by now we are uh, ready to release you to our schools. So what you can do is you can check your emails. If you are subscribed to ClearMit emails, you will receive this email that will tell you what breakout room links there are available to you today for each of the five schools. We're also going to post these links in our chat, which I'm trying to do right now. Uh, so you can click on them here. Uh, if you are able to copy those down and save them, this room will probably close before the breakouts. So take those links, either save your email or uh, copy down from the chat uh, somewhere on a Word doc or in a chat somewhere else. So that way you can join as many rooms as you want. Uh, again, our panelists will be in their rooms probably to at least the bottom of this hour. So another 20, 25 minutes or so, some might be a little bit longer. So you can jump between rooms, uh, ask your questions, enjoy it. Thank you all for joining us today, uh, for staying up late. I saw some folks that were from, you know, Eastern Asia, uh, Oceania, all these other areas of the world where it's the middle of the night. So thank you for staying up with us and from learning from these great schools. We have one more session in our May series next week with four more schools. Come and join us. We'd love to see you again. We'll talk to Columbia, Cornell, Georgetown, and I'm going to forget the fourth because that is just what I'm doing right now. Um, Georgetown and Virginia Darden. So come back to talk to those four schools. Uh, check out the videos from the prior weeks. Thank you once again. Uh, we hope you learned something today. We hope we'll see you back on our site for future events and uh, we'll see you soon.